Welcome to this pre-recorded presentation produced by the Expo Advanced Consortium led by Creme Global. Within this 60 minute presentation, we will take you through the key project methods findings and study outputs from the Expo Advanced Project initiated in June 2023. The rationale for this project stems from the increasing complexity of chemical exposure assessments. While EFSA has established methodologies for dietary exposure, there is a pressing need to advance and harmonize approaches for quantifying aggregate exposure to chemicals from various routes, oral, dermal, and inhalation, and sources such as air, soil, diet, and consumer products. Currently, non-dietary exposures are often acknowledged but not quantified due to methodological and data limitations. Aggregate exposure, AE, can be defined as an individual's total exposure to a substance from one or more sources that occurs by one or more routes of exposure, ingestion, inhalation, and topical. AE is characterized by a systemic dose, mass of a chemical absorbed by all roots, or a concentration of a chemical in internal media, such as tissue and organs, that results from the aggregate dose. The systemic dose received from AE can be estimated using exposure models or human biomonitoring, HBM, data. Exposure models. These are mathematical equations that calculate the dose an individual receives from different sources and exposure routes. They sum the absorbed doses to determine the aggregate dose. Then, physiologically based kinetic PBK models are used to map the chemical's concentration across various body compartments, tissues, and organs. Human biomonitoring. HBM data. This involves measuring chemicals, their metabolites or reaction products in human specimens known as biomarkers. PBK models help translate these measurements into predictions of the aggregate dose and internal concentrations in an individual. Both methods are independent yet complementary, offering robust and corroborative estimates of AE. There are two strategies for combining exposure models, aggregate exposure estimates or AEs and human biomonitoring or HBM based estimates of aggregate exposure. The initial approach termed forward dosimetry involves predicting aggregate dose from an exposure model and then using a PBK model to estimate the corresponding biomarker levels in an individual. This prediction is then compared with observed biomarker levels. Conversely, the second strategy, termed reverse dosimetry, employs a PBK model of a chemical to estimate the systemic dose responsible for an observed level of an exposure biomarker. This approach provides an independent measure of aggregate dose, allowing for the evaluation of predictions from an exposure model. AEs require a separate exposure model for each source and route of exposure. For certain well-researched compounds, such as phthalates, parabens, and bisphenols, it's feasible to conduct an AEA solely based on HBM and reverse dosimetry. However, the most reliable estimates of AAE are achieved when predictions are derived from both exposure modeling and HBM data. In such instances, HBM-based AE estimates are utilized to validate exposure predictions generated by models, while exposure models enhance the HBM findings to address concerns pertinent to risk management. While efforts are underway to increase the range of chemicals assessed using HBM-based exposure assessments, it's improbable that all chemicals relevant to EFSA will be covered in the near future. 
Consequently, assessing AE for most commercial chemicals will likely necessitate a combination of exposure models and PBK models supplemented by HBM data when available. The EU Chemical Strategy for Sustainability's One Substance, One Assessment approach anticipates an increase in requests for comprehensive exposure assessments. Ultimately, the roadmap aims to enhance EFSA's preparedness in this space by achieving two primary objectives. One, identify key aspects, gaps and levels of complexity required in methodologies and knowledge for aggregate exposure assessments. Two, identify and prioritize working areas and projects that will enhance EFSA's capacity to efficiently address requests for aggregate exposure assessments. This roadmap aims to pave the way for a harmonized approach to aggregate exposure assessment in the EU. By addressing current gaps and fostering collaboration, we aim to equip EFSA with the necessary tools and methodologies for comprehensive chemical exposure assessments. This undertaking is crucial, not only for current regulatory needs, but also for future-proofing EFSA's capacity to handle the increasing complexity of chemical risk assessments. To advance EFSA's exposure assessments in order to address current human health risk assessment, the Expo Advance Roadmap aims to contribute to, one, developing a cross-cutting EU methodology and supportive data streams for assessing AEs of chemicals for the general EU population. Two, developing frameworks, guidance and PBK models for forward and reverse dosimetry. Three, mapping collaborations with EU agencies, member states, MS, and bodies or committees involved in chemical risk assessment. Our project focused on several key pillars and objectives. One, roadmap development plan. Develop a protocol for roadmap development based on the problem formulation outlined in the theme paper for advancing aggregate exposure to chemicals in the EU. Two, mapping activities. Map needs, priorities and existing projects in aggregate exposure assessment across EU agencies and internationally. Three, data and knowledge gaps. Identify knowledge gaps and challenges in aggregate exposure assessment and exposure reconstruction. Four, challenges and blockers. Identify challenges and blockers for the development of harmonized and scientifically sound methodologies to carry out refined aggregate exposure assessments, tackling and quantifying the contribution from different sources of exposure. Five, working areas. Prioritize working areas and provide recommendations for multi-annual studies or projects. Six, cooperation. Identify cooperation opportunities and potential partners, evaluating means for collaboration. Seven, communication. Develop a communication plan to engage EFSA's partners and stakeholders. In developing the roadmap, we conducted several mapping activities under Work Package 2. First, we held an online expert workshop on problem formulation. This workshop addressed the three key aspects of the roadmap introduced earlier in breakout sessions with experts, mainly from public institutions and academia. We guided discussions with tailored questions and collected feedback through whiteboards and recorded scripts. We performed two literature reviews on the main aspects of the roadmap methodologies and supportive data streams for aggregate exposure assessment, and frameworks guidance and PBK models for forward and reverse dosimetry. We used PubMed, Web of Science, 
Scopus and Google Scholar for our searches and Distiller to screen and extract relevant articles. We also integrated knowledge from other sources, PARC, OECD, EFSA, US EPA and ESSATOC through workshops, project meetings and conferences. To complete our overview, we identified relevant projects via the EU Cordis platform and conducted face-to-face -face interviews to explore future collaboration opportunities. Online interviews were organized with officers from European Commission Directorate General and agencies involved in chemical safety, as well as other risk assessment bodies. For example, the Scientific Committee on Consumer Safety, the Scientific Committee on Health, Environmental and Emerging Risks. We also collected expert feedback through an online survey on methods and tools relevant to aggregate exposure assessment, with respondents mainly from public bodies and research organisations. Based on these activities, we identified the needs and priorities of EFSA and other regulatory agencies in determining the aggregate exposure of chemicals. We documented the current state of aggregate exposure assessment and mapped these needs and priorities against existing data and knowledge to identify gaps, challenges and blockers. These gaps informed the potential working areas drafted in Work Package 3. The work areas were refined during a second workshop. A prioritization process of the finalized work areas was conducted using a list of prioritization criteria in a prioritization matrix. The revised work areas were used to define a series of potential research project proposals, which were assessed and refined by experts through focus groups with experts. A SWOT analysis tool was used to support the recommendation of the list of proposal projects. Finally, WP4 launched an online communication survey to gather insights on engagement with stakeholders, communication with the general public, and communication channels and methods for effective communication of the AEA roadmap to both stakeholders and the general public. Needs and priorities for aggregate exposure assessment identified for EFSA and other regulatory agencies and committees in the light of the current state of art of aggregate exposure assessment by using exposure, PBK modeling and human biomonitoring can be summarized as follows. Tools have to be developed to efficiently perform aggregate exposure assessments on chemicals. Use of these tools entails access to data that are needed for them to work. There is an overarching need for developing guidance. In particular, guidance documents should be created to establish how to enter data and interpret the output of the tools, how to select and use higher tier exposure models whenever they are needed, and how to use HBM data. Guidance should be created for chemicals where the drivers of aggregate exposure fall under different regulatory authorities. Guidance should be established based on case studies of representative chemicals, meaning chemicals with large amounts of exposure data and chemicals with limited data. An approach for achieving these needs was constructed. A framework was created to describe how a combination of exposure modeling and PBK modeling can be used to characterize aggregate exposures to a chemical using HPM data. The framework has four components. First, assessment of source specific exposures. Second, performing a screening assessment of aggregate exposure. Third, an iterative use of higher tiered exposure models. Fourth, reporting and interpretation of results. The four components of such a framework for efficiently performing aggregate exposure assessment are shown in a more detailed way here. <laughs>
First, sources of exposure are identified and low tier estimates of dose for each source meant for screening purposes are developed. Second, Low tier estimates of aggregate dose are determined by summing the source specific doses to assess whether the aggregate dose is a concern. If this is not the case, the assessment stops here. If on the contrary, the aggregate dose is a concern, sources that drive the aggregate exposure are identified. In the third step, higher tier exposure assessment is performed for sources that drive the aggregate exposure and a revised estimate of aggregate exposure is obtained. If such revised estimate indicates that aggregate dose is a concern, sources that drive the aggregate exposure in this higher tier assessment are identified and for them, probabilistic models are developed and applied to obtain a refined estimate of aggregate exposure. This process may proceed in an iterative manner. In the fourth step, reporting and interpretation of results follows. If aggregate dose is a concern, the refined estimate of aggregate exposure exceeding the tolerable or acceptable dose values is reported along with the sources driving the aggregate exposure, thus documenting the overall findings. The relevant populations for each source and the existence of any vulnerable population should be reported. If the different dose estimates are consistent, this informs the final assessment of aggregate exposure, allowing conclusions to be reached in a more reliable way. Agreement between biomarkers data observed in HBM and the predictions of forward dissymmetry or agreement between the dose estimates from the exposure models and the dose estimates from the reverse dissymmetry increases the confidence that can be placed in the estimates. When the findings do not agree, the framework indicates that the exposure assessment should be re-examined. This review should include the exposure modeling, the PBK modeling and the HBM data. The assessment is re-examined until consistency is achieved so that the final conclusions are more robust. In this and the following two slides, the identified knowledge and information gaps are examined and for each gap, the challenges and blockers that have to be overcome for developing a capability to perform aggregate exposure assessments are highlighted. The first gap area identified is the characterization of source specific exposures. The following challenges and blockers in this area were identified. Firstly, the variation in the characteristics of different chemical exposures will require a wide range of source specific models. Secondly, the large number of chemicals used in commerce require significant resources to identify, collect and curate data. Data needed to define the exposed population may require additional research. Thirdly, such data is complex and vary with how they are measured. Synthesis of multiple sources of data may be required. Fourthly, for some sources, data may need to be created by monitoring programs or surveys of human behaviors. The second gap area is screening assessments of the chemicals aggregate exposure. The challenges and blockers identified in this area are that confidentiality may affect data availability. Databases would be large and include chemical specific data for large numbers of chemicals and tables of default values for other model inputs. The third gap area is high tier exposure models. The following challenges and blockers were identified. Developing guidance could be a complex process. The options for higher tier models will be source and chemical specific. The process must be regularly updated to reflect new data and models. 
no surveys of concurrent use of consumer products and diet and activity patterns. New approaches for modeling the potential for co-exposures may be provided. Data generation through surveys is time and resource consuming. Temporal variation is limited to days and weeks. There is limited experience in characterizing uncertainty in higher tier models of aggregate exposure assessments. However, HBM provides the possibility of an independent measure of aggregate exposure as a comparison to model estimates. The fourth gap area is PBK modeling. There are several challenges and blockers identified. Generating in vitro and in silico data to capture the biological mechanisms and organizing a centralized curated database with ADME data. Having confidence intervals available to provide a range of values reflecting the model's uncertainty and variability. Data on metabolites are difficult to generate and predict. Targeted methodologies, both in vitro and in silico, to develop more complex PBK model platforms. Default low tier kinetic conversion factors should also be developed. Model interoperability, curated data platforms. Variation of chemical kinetics across age groups. Harmonized methodologies and guidance relevant to reverse dosimetry. The fifth gap category concerns data collection, curation and access. Considering the large number of chemicals, the type of relevant data and data streams needed for aggregate exposure assessment is large. Regulatory guidance to perform AEAs is the sixth gap category identified. Some challenges related to this gap are, aggregate exposure is dependent on sources of exposure that may be addressed by different regulations. Some data is confidential. Shared data management systems would need to be developed. Complete sharing of data may not be possible due to the confidential nature of some data. Regulatory harmonization may be required. What are the working areas identified? Based on the data obtained from the presented activities, which allowed for the identification of data and knowledge gaps, needs and priorities of EFSA, and other regulatory agencies when determining AE of chemicals, together with the challenges and blockers that would hinder efforts to fill the data gaps, the team identified key working areas where additional research and development are required to achieve EFSA's goal. 19 working areas were first formulated based on EFSA's needs and the evidence collected through the mapping activities. For their further refinement and prioritization, the team invited several experts from public bodies, academia, consultancy, and EU institutions to a second virtual expert workshop, where the drafted work areas, WAs, were presented and experts feedback collected on their completeness and relevance. Based on the experts' inputs and recommendation and a consensus between the team members, 16 potential work areas were finalized and ready for the prioritization exercise, which was done using an online tool shared with the external experts. To support and facilitate the prioritization process of the working areas, the team reviewed available documents and guidelines and compiled six criteria. One, relevance. Two, coherence. Three, effectiveness. Four, efficiency. Five, impact. And six, sustainability. Following the OECD evaluation criteria, OECD 2019. Those were presented to the experts with the respective meaning for the project and the specific questions.
prioritization criteria is an objective system or tool used to prioritize and rank the identified work areas. They are specific, measurable, and relevant to the goals and manageable from an implementation viewpoint in terms of their number. A criterion is a standard or principle used in evaluations as the basis for evaluative judgment, OECD 2021A. This is an important element in developing a priority setting matrix, a simple tool in a variation of the L-shaped priorities matrix, where each criteria and their relative weights as labels along one edge and the list of options, work areas, along the other edge for a transparent ranking of the work areas identified. The experts were invited to conduct a weighing of each of the criteria by assigning quantitative scores to each criterion. Almost all experts agreed that the criterion relevance is of the highest importance with 93% of votes, followed by effectiveness with 75% of votes and impact with 77% of votes. The experts were then invited to score the 16 work areas for the six criteria on a scale of one to five, one being of less priority and five being of highest priority. The obtained scores and comments from experts indicated that the work areas identified are highly interdependent. The process of prioritization confirmed also that the work areas are all equally important and additional research and development in all of them is required to achieve EFSA's goal. The 16 potential work areas identified are organized into four categories. WA category one, methodology. WA category two, data generation, collection, organization and curation. WA Category 3, Framework and Guidance. WA Category 4, Innovative and Additional Considerations. There were eight WAs identified under methodology. Two WAs under Data Generation, Collection, Organization and Curation. Three WAs under Framework and Guidance category and the other three WAs were identified under the fourth category. The 16 work areas are very interdependent. Orange equals methodology work areas. Green equals work areas involved in data generation, collection, organization, and curation. Yellow equals framework and guidance work areas. Blue equals work areas that involve innovative areas or specifying activities not explicitly addressed in EFSA problem formulation. Information generated under one work area can be a necessary input to other work areas. It is thus important to recognize these interdependencies as work areas that fall in the same category can appear in different sequences in the flow of information. The illustration here relates also the identified work areas with other roadmaps in trapezoid boxes, highlighting cross-cutting topics, namely the roadmap for action on risk assessment of combined exposure to multiple chemicals, race mike, De Jong et al. 2022, and the EFSA NAMS roadmap through advancing toxicokinetic knowledge in chemical risk assessment, which is under implementation. Dashed arrows represent interlinks between the work areas that directly align with EFSA problem formulation, the innovative areas, and the identified roadmaps. Subsequently, the 16 work areas were used to define a series of specific research project proposals. The project team drafted first proposals for 24 projects and invited 11 experts to the first focus group to assess, discuss and further refinement of the drafted project proposals.
experts were requested to give input on the time frame and to complete a project benefit quadrant for effort versus impact. High effort and low impact, high effort and high impact, low effort and low impact, low effort and high impact. Based on suggestions by focus group one participants and a consensus within the project team, several project proposals were merged, resulting in a total of 10 project proposals going forward for review in focus group two. The same experts were invited and eight participated. This time, the aim was to revise the timeline of the suggested projects, to rank each project and to conduct a SWOT analysis. A SWOT analysis requires project developers and reviewers to identify strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats for each project. As an outcome of the activity, and based on the feedback from the experts, a final set of eight project proposals were refined and finalised for inclusion in the roadmap. Each project was described in more detail, including a rationale on project contents, objectives, scientific gaps addressed, work areas covered, indication of relative priority, high, medium, low, a link to other projects, dependencies, in order to support decision on which projects to develop and implement first, project duration, an approximate budget, partners and stakeholders that could be strategically involved and the SWOT analysis. Here we illustrate the shortlisted eight projects mapped against the gap areas and working area categories. We will now summarize each project in turn. Project one under the working area framework and guidance is a medium term duration project and aims in the development of an aggregate exposure assessment methodological framework. Because the number of chemicals is potentially large with different degrees of data availability and often complex use patterns, aggregate exposure assessment requires an overarching methodological framework based on harmonized methods and tools for AEA for chemicals with dietary and non-dietary sources of exposures. Such a framework methodology document should include a scoping phase and decision tree, aggregation strategy, tiered approach and elaboration of tiers and uncertainty analysis. Regulatory acceptance and broad use of the AEA framework will require that the methodology be developed in cooperation with partner agencies and relevant international stakeholders and testing using a series of pilot studies. The project is considered fundamental and of high priority. Project two, under the working methodology, is a medium term duration project and aims in the development of an AEA open access model system. This project will develop the conceptual design and will construct an open access modeling network and platform, building on existing tools and adding new model developments, specific functionalities for exposure aggregation and data platform interoperability. The system would be an open source exposure modeling platform to assess the source to dose processes, including release of the chemicals from a source, transport and fate, exposure and dose determination. The system would generate the screening AE estimate and refinement from the use of higher tiered exposure models. The platform should offer a complete set of models that allow the application of the cross-regulatory AEA framework. Collaboration with PARC, RI Consortia, and sister agency ECHA is recommended. The project is considered of high priority. Project three under the working methodology is a longer term duration project and aims in the development of a higher tier probabilistic aggregate exposure model and models for human inter-individual variability. Existing models can predict inter-individual variation in the dose from individual types of exposure, including consumption of multiple foods, 
from the use of multiple consumer products or from exposure to a chemical in multiple environmental media. However, there is no probabilistic model that can characterize inter-individual variation in aggregate exposure from two or more of these categories of sources. The project should develop a higher tier probabilistic aggregate exposure model of systemic aggregate doses that individuals receive from dietary and non-dietary sources using a person-orientated model, POM approach, and by building on existing exposure models for diet, consumer products, and environmental sources. Collaboration with PARC and model owners, as well as sister agency, ECHA, is recommended. The project is considered of high priority. Project four under the working area methodology and the working area data generation, collection, organization, and curation is a medium term duration project that aims in the use of human biomonitoring as a tool for supporting aggregate exposure. Availability of HBM data and the PBK models necessary to perform forward and reverse dissymmetry remain limited. In addition, HBM surveys are not carried out with a view to assess aggregate exposure. This project would develop guidance on the use of existing HBM data in assessing a chemical's AE in the population using forward and reverse dissymmetry. In addition, recommendations would be developed on how future campaigns of biomonitoring can be designed to better support and inform assessments of chemicals AEs. The project would design and undertake campaigns to provide HBM data for pilot studies of the exposure modeling platform created. Collaboration with national public health institutions and laboratories, relevant RNI consortia and partnerships and sister agencies, EEA, ECHA, is recommended. The project is considered of high priority. Project five under the working area data generation, collection, organization and curation is a medium term duration project that aims in a data platform to support aggregate exposure assessment. Data centralization and an open data platform are foreseen as part of the common data platform towards the one substance, one assessment, one S1A reform under the chemical strategy for sustainability. The aim of this project is to engage in the development of the common interoperable open data platform to host data from member states and national programs, academics and RNI partnerships, industry and other sources. Together with sister agencies, the project would focus on significant efforts that are required to define vocabulary and data templates and to ensure that all types of raw data needed for an AEA will be hosted and interoperability ensured. Additional objectives are exploring data sharing strategies for human biomonitoring data developing SOPs and minimum data standards for implementing a crowdsourcing program for data collection. Engagement and collaborations include sister agencies, policymakers, data owners, and ongoing initiatives such as PARC. The project is considered of medium priority. Project six under the working area methodology is a medium term duration project that aims in extension of the open access AEA model system to include forward and reverse dissymmetry. In the context of AE, there is a need to predict the internal dose associated to a chemical specific pattern of exposure. To achieve this, an internal aggregate exposure framework utilizing PBK modeling should be explored and integrated or linked to the open access AEA model system. A PBK model system, including generic PBK models and higher tier chemical specific PBK models needs to be developed in order to guide the application of PBK models in an AEA tiered approach.
the model system will be developed and evaluated through suitable case studies. A data platform supporting PBK modeling would be developed complementarily and can be integrated in the common data platform. The project would build on existing initiatives, PARC. The project is considered of medium priority. Project 7 under the Working Area Data Generation, Collection, Organization and Curation and Working Area Framework and Guidance is a short to medium term project and aims in the development of an exposure and risk repository. For the vast number of chemical substances and in fast evolving chemical market, efficient AEA requires a tiered approach with an initial screening without extensive data collection. A vast amount of chemical safety assessments is performed and exposure assessments and risk conclusions obtained previously provides a so far unexplored data source for an AE screening assessment tier zero step and is especially valuable where aggregate exposure comes from dietary and non-dietary sources from substances with a diverse and complex commercial use pattern. The project would develop a structured glossary of health-based reference values and risk metrices and dedicated OECD harmonized template, OHT, for their reporting. Furthermore, establish an inventory of substances under EFSA remit that have both dietary and non-dietary consumer uses and exposures, sourcing of previously obtained exposure estimates and risk matrices for substances of interest. The project requires collaboration with sister agencies and various stakeholders. The project is considered of medium priority. Project 8 is a short-term project under the Working Area Methodology, Working Area Data Generation Collection Organization and Curation, and Working Area Innovative and Additional Considerations. The project aims to support fast prioritization, scoping and problem formulation for AEA on a tier zero screening level for chemicals within EFSA regulatory domain. Data demands, as well as the effort needed to carry out an AEA, increase from lower to higher tier assessments. There is an immense and ever-growing number of chemical substances identified chemical uses on the European market governed under different regulatory silos. Consequently, AEA is neither feasible nor reasonable to be carried out for all chemical substances. A tool designed as a single entry point and using existing and available chemicals data would offer a set of services to query the content, as well as analysis such as eventually offering a feature for criteria-based substance ranking and a quantified visualization. The objectives of the project include the development of policy recommendations on the needed data, fairness, and information requirements for AEA, and the conceptualization of the relevant AEA knowledge domain represented by the selected databases. Furthermore, the development of a tool supporting tier zero screening assessment, either a standalone software or a module to be embedded in another platform. Several case studies have been considered as an important start as topics of common interest with potential partner agencies, ECHA, EEA, EU OSHA, EMA, and the Scientific Committee on Consumer Safety. This has been identified during the online video interviews and the survey. Furthermore, the results from the survey were also analyzed to search for potential hot topics. The result of these sources of information was a list of case studies to be considered. Among these, chemical contaminants in food and feed were suggested by EFSA, EEA and JRC representatives including acrylamide and mycotoxins, EFSA, brominated flame retardants, EFSA and DG Sante, metals and biocides, EEA, and pesticide residues, EMA and DG Sante, 
Food and water contact materials were named also, such as phthalates, EFSA, DG Sante, JRC, and plasticizers. In addition, food ingredients and additives such as vitamin A, Scientific Committee on Consumer Safety, and enzymes used both in medicines and food, EFSA, were printed out, as well as Cosmetics Drinking Water Directive, ECA, environmental contaminants such as per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances, bisphenols, were as well indicated as relevant case studies, JRC, EFSA, EEA, DG Sante. We suggest building on PARC, HBM for EU, Euromix, or COFIS. Establishing synergies between the scientists engaged in these projects and policymakers, as well as an active involvement of different stakeholders, would enable medium to long term cooperation and collaboration. During the interviews with experts, information on the opportunities and obstacles for each agency to engage in the roadmap for aggregate exposure was retrieved. Communication between sectors is highlighted as pivotal for setting an aggregate exposure strategy across different regulatory silos. Overall, the interaction with experts laid the groundwork for a potential long-term collaboration between EFSA and identified partners, aimed at investigating several hot topic case studies of common interest to partner agencies and committees. The purpose of the communication and engagement plan is intended to guide clear and accessible communication and engagement with key stakeholders, both during and following aggregate exposure assessments. The plan is informed by the outcomes of this project, including a survey on communication opportunities conducted with experts, best practice identified by consortium partners, and existing EFSA toolkits already published. It is intended to promote the Expo Advance Roadmap to relevant stakeholders, including but not limited to scientific stakeholders. The Communication Engagement Plan emphasizes careful consideration of the intended target audiences for dissemination of communication and engagement activity with, for example, public bodies, EU institutions, academia or research institutes, industry and consultancy companies. With these audiences in mind, communication and engagement materials can be designed to meet the needs of these stakeholder groups with consideration of four key aspects as illustrated here. To maximize awareness and impact from the expert advanced study findings as the primary objective, consideration must be given for how best to clearly communicate these findings to prompt consideration for policy and practice implications amongst the different target audiences. Two, key message content should be dynamic and mapped to the overarching project objective. Consideration should be given to the key study findings across the different stages of the study methodology deployed. For example, mapping activities conducted, data and knowledge gaps identified, challenges and blockers identified, and collaboration opportunities. Again, these key messages should be tailored to specific audiences. Three, to transmit findings effectively, a selection of methods or channels should be used, including a policy brief, infographic and PowerPoint presentation. These materials provide concise summaries, visual illustrations and recommendations to present the main outcomes of the roadmap using plain language. Four, timing of delivery and subsequent follow ups should then reflect the communication plan as a living document, subject to review and revision throughout the project's delivery and following completion, drawing on best practices and existing evidence to maximise expert advance impacts.
the communication materials produced to disseminate the Expo Advance project and outcomes are targeted to professionals, researchers, and policymakers in the field of aggregate exposure. These include the roadmap itself, along with a policy brief and infographic. The policy brief presents the key messages, results, and policy uptakes arising from the Expo Advance project. The infographic illustrates the roadmap and its key outcomes. This concludes our recorded presentation and represents the final study deliverable issued to EFSA for the Expo Advance project, having now shared the resulting roadmap for action for advancing aggregate exposure in the EU. On behalf of all of the consortium members, we thank EFSA for their support on this project and contributing stakeholders who have contributed valuable input through participating interviews, focus groups and survey activities. We now open the floor to receive questions from EFSA and wider stakeholders.